to be back. Uh, enjoy coming out and seeing all my friends in Los Angeles. I got caught in a blizzard in New York. I had a gig. What the hell, you know? Several blizzards here tonight. I got caught in a blizzard. You ever try to start your car in a cold blizzard? When the car, the car seems to talk to you like a poetry. Of the, Please don't try to stop me. Please don't try to stop me. Leave me alone. There's an old man, retired, walking his dog with advice. You're going to flood it, young fella. <laughs> Just like, what's wrong with this? something? There's a short. It's one of those cliches. Yeah. You're going to flood it. OK. Um, everything stopped still. New York was so beautiful in the snowstorm. And even the panhandlers, my favorite Mr. Please here. Is, he's a famous man. He works Carnegie Hall over to Cinema One and back. The guy is, forget it, the best panhandler of all time. Leaves nothing to chance. When you pass him, he looks very pathetic and goes, Please! I'm hungry! I gave him a quarter, half. I would have written him checks, given him credit cards. A week later, he blew his bit, and I felt so stupid. I saw him lowering his belongings into a Buick Electra. <laughs> I said, hey, please, what's the story? Then, a couple of months later, at the parking lot at NBC, I saw another guy, younger, going, please! It's a franchise. <laughs> he sells please kits to people. They go around the country. New York isn't like a Charles Bronson movie. You know, that movie was fun. You see all these people get blasted away, the most vicious people in the world. But, I mean, why is it that Charles Bronson had such bad luck in New York? Every time he stepped out of his house, all right, put your hands up, you know. He went to his grandmother, his grandmother, all right, give him your money, everywhere he went. I mean, it was unbelievable, it was not believable. He's on a subway car at two in the morning, it's Charles Bronson's in the car, uh, sitting opposite him is an old lady counting $100 bills. The muggers come in, they look at the other, Let's get the big guy with the scar in his face. He is <laughs> the last guy in the world I'd ever want to mug is Charles Bronson. <laughs> I was educated in very good Eastern schools, too. PS 94, yeah. <laughs> PS 80. We had names instead of numbers in the East, which is slightly dehumanizing. And we actually had songs, and I'm not making this up. I want to be the kind of boy that 94 can boast about. 80, dear 80. Your name will rise, ab your name will rise above 79. That's what your name will rise above. <laughs> When I come out here, or I visit Texas, or, you know, the West and the South, a different pace, you get off the planes, or, and I come off with my New York pace, well, we better go over the interview at 7.30, and then 8 o'clock I have to meet you. It's all right, Robert. <laughs> you can get there at 7 or 7.30 or 8 or 9 or not at all. <laughs> Sit down and have a pearl beer, you know, that's all I do. Hand forms a little a bit. I went to a very rural college called Alfred University, and, uh, which is very popular here, one can tell. <laughs> and I, here I am from the Bronx. I get off the train in Hornell, New York, one of the most rural places in the United States. I look out the window and I said, my God, look at that dog. <laughs> oh my God, it's got a tumor hanging from it with fingers. <laughs> I thought the milk comes out of the cow right into the container, you know, <laughs> in the container. I thought it was a Dalmatian. What did I know? By the way, I do work a lot of the colleges. I went back to my... There will be a test on this show immediately afterwards. <laughs> going to be a multiple choice. Going to be tough. Nine choices all alike. I, I thought a multiple choice was okay when they said, which of these is different? I like a nice, obvious multiple choice. A camel, a rhinoceros, an elephant, a raisin. That's the kind of multiple choice. <laughs> you know? But then you start thinking, wait a minute. A raisin is wrinkled. Hold it. <laughs> An elephant is wrinkled, too. It could be an abstract multiple choice. <laughs> Where's my mark? I've been going over my mark. You guys... <laughs> you ought to have a bowling light for me when you go, eh, you're over. <laughs> I apologize to America out there trying to go to sleep or brushing their teeth. I've been like a bad Zoom all night, you know, going in. I had it. That's why I stopped bowling. It made me guilty. You can't argue with an electric guy, right? And you're over. I swear it's broken. I'm not. I also stopped bowling because I didn't know whether I'd like it or not. I started when I was 18. I didn't want to spend the 20 bucks for the shoes. So I did the smart thing. Over 12 years, I spent $600 renting bowling shoes. At the alley which is a pretty repulsive concept to begin with. It's renting shoes, kind of like renting a Kleenex, you know what I mean? <laughs> certain things in life you rent, certain, and, they, and the alley puts size 12 and spangles on the back. And 
Webster alleys, and they have a chain, so you can't go further than your alley. <laughs> Did you hear about this? I forgot which company. One of the biggies in bowling, Brunswick or AMF, one of those. How many bowling companies are there, you know? <laughs> the small family. There's a Mon Pi outfit that makes bowling. Anyway, they built 90 alleys in Moscow for the Russians. <laughs> and also 90 million bucks. So the opening ceremonies, international ceremonies, the head of the American company gets the shot at the first ball, bowls a gutter ball. Then he gets it back, he wiggles his behind, you know, makes excuses. She went Jersey on me. You know, one of those kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> These guys have been wonderful through the years. Don't you? <laughs> I'm humped over. Oh, that's right, you know. He gets his second ball, he bowls a second gutter ball. This actually happened. This is the president of the bowling company. Now, the Russian bigwig, it's his turn. He thinks that's the way the game is played. <laughs> don't eat the pins, whatever you do, only in the groove. You know, you know. See them with a the gold tooth there? You know the Russians. I die, you know. Let's not make fun, they're from another land. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, they complained about the Swedish submarine when their submarine got caught in the Swedish base there. You have rocks in the bay. Yeah, you know, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so as far as the bowling was concerned, they said, look, Russians, you paid 90 million. We love you. They took the money, it's called Groove Ball. We hope you enjoy it, you know. <laughs> Now, if this ever becomes an Olympic sport, we have 25 years on those birds. <laughs> They'll be going to in the group, we lose a game. They won't understand. They'll probably cheat, though. They'll give the guys steroids. You know, that's Popoff, their best bowler there, and that's his forearm in the sidecar coming alongside. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's appeared on the show you had, you're getting a few little gray hairs now. I know. Yeah. Um, no ago. comment. You no have comment. A few yeah. You got a movie coming up. I want to mention before we run out of time. On, a, on the, as they say, another network. It's on another network. I won't mention it. Civic. Yeah. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I play a romantic lead. You know, for a guy, I mean, I've done ten films, and unfortunately, I'm not thought of enough in the romantic category. But I've been in the sack about five times in movies. Really? Yeah. And it's the most unromantic thing in the world. With all those people around when you're trying. Yeah, to, technicians. Yeah. You know, pant a little louder, Robert, and move this way. You know. Yeah. And uh, years ago, I did a picture called Rivals with Joan Hacker. This one's called um, uh, Your Place of Mine, and it's on March 2nd right. with Bonnie Franklin. And I think it's pretty dignified. Do you remember what you did 15 years ago on this show? Yes. I spoke about having been a substitute school teacher. Which you were at one time. Which I was while I was waiting for things to happen, and how about being wakened in the morning, and how you overcompensate when you're awakened in a hurry. When you're awakened out of a deep sleep, so you, you try, you, I, I used to practice as the phone rang. It was a principal from a school calling me in the morning, and it goes ring. I go, oh, hello, hello. Ring, ring, hello, oh, hello, ring, hello. You know, you finally get up there. And he said, uh, hello, Mr. Klein. You always say the same thing. It was Mr. Terigi from so-and-so junior high school. I didn't wake you, did I? Oh, no, I was just reading the Bible, Mr. Terigi. <laughs> right. I mean, it was a little early. Did I wake you? No, it's a quarter to six. Were you, uh, uh, I'm a coal miner. In know? those days, were you, uh, <laughs> were you making any money at all, or were you... Uh... I made twenty-four fifty a day. See, I'd gone to Yale graduate school, and then I was an overeducated bomb. I mean, in the sense that here I was, no more school. School is a very protective thing. Yeah. And I felt uh, that this gave me self-confidence, and I got a little cockroach-nested apartment of my own. <laughs> And I loved it, and the rest is history. And here we are today, and we're going away 